Hey everybody, welcome. My name is Tom, and this is the first in a series of tutorials on Conway's Game of Life. We're gonna be creating Conway's Game of Life using Python, and specifically Python 3.4. And we're also gonna be using a graphics library called Pyglet or Piglet or PyGL. I'm gonna call it Pyglet just because it's Python mixed with OpenGL. Feel free to call it Piglet or whatever you'd like. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I looked around actually for the pronunciation, but I couldn't, I couldn't find anything, okay? So this is actually gonna be part of a whole bunch of smaller series where I'm gonna be showing you how to simulate life and using you know, mostly Pyglet and Python, but I might branch off onto other languages and stuff later on. But what we're gonna be doing is, starting with Conway's Game of Life, we'll then be moving to how to simulate basic microorganism movement and then later I might even use neural networks or or genetic algorithms or anything like that in order to create more complex movement and more complex life. I uh, will also get into things like crowd simulation and flocking and other things. So this is just a, a beginner tutorial also to get uh, used to using uh, Pyglet and eventually we'll move on and, and do more advanced stuff. So subscribe to the channel and check back from time to time and hopefully yeah, you'll learn something new. All right, uh, so some of you I'm sure have heard of uh, Conway's Game of Life and maybe some of you haven't. Maybe some of you are watching this for a class where your teacher said, go code Conway's Game of Life. Well, what Conway's Game of Life is, for those of you that don't know, is a very simple way uh, to create something that can replicate, essentially, creating a very simplistic little life form. And this life form exists in this grid world. So this, this is an example, this is a screenshot from Conway's Game of Life. And in this grid world, each one of these little squares in the grid can be occupied by a creature, which in this case is blue, or it can be empty, which is white. And through each time step, in this world, so from one second to the next in this world, all of these creatures will either will either live, die, or procreate based on a simple, simple set of rules. And these rules are like this. I'm not gonna tell you the exact rules, but I'll give you an example. So if you look here at this guy, so he has around him eight possible neighbors. Seven of those neighbors have nothing in them, seven neighboring squares. One square has something in it. Now, the rules might say, well, that's not enough neighbors. You only have one neighbor. You're quite lonely, so you die. Uh, if you have too many neighbors, maybe you have three neighbors or four neighbors or five neighbors, like some of these others, that's gonna be too many neighbors. Then you will starve because you are, you're overcrowded or if you're off by yourself, you could be lonely, or if you have just the right amount, maybe two neighbors or three neighbors, then you're perfect. You have just the right amount and you're gonna live. So that's really all the rules are. You either have just the right amount of neighbors, so you live, you have too many neighbors, so you die, or you have not enough neighbors, so you die. Okay, and this idea was actually created in the 1940s by a mathematician called John von Neumann. And John von Neumann, uh, came, he wanted to create something that was self-replicating. And so he came up with that set of rules or something similar to that. And it took about 30 some years before another person, a guy named John Conway, to come along and take this idea and say, oh, all right, well, this is kind of cool. And he created this grid world with it and he then animated it. And what this grid world did was actually spark a whole bunch of interest in cellular automata, or Conway's game of life. And this created a whole branch of mathematics, and people wrote books about it. In fact, there's a very uh, semi-popular book by uh, Wolfram, the guy from wolframalpha.com, who he believes cellular automata are a very important subset of mathematics. and he created, I think the book is like a thousand pages and feel free to go read it. It's very, it's debated whether it holds any validity or, validity or not, uh, but feel free to go read it and judge for yourself. What we're gonna do is we're not gonna debate 
any of that stuff at all. We're just going to build a really cool visualization so we can see how this stuff works. All right, so I'm at a website called conwaysgameoflife.appspot.com, and on this I've drawn three or four really distinct things. These two are kind of similar, just odd, weird looking shapes. I've drawn a nice box here, and I've put these little lone dots. Now, going back to the rules I had before, uh, are the rules I, I, I gave. Now, I'll go later into the exact details of them, but just the basic things are too many, you die, too few, you die, just the right amount, you live. So let's take a look at these. Uh, if I go one step in time, all of these guys will die. And actually, everything inside of this box is going to die as well because they're all overcrowded. And these things in the middle of these are going to die. But at the same time, some others might procreate. They might have just the right number of, of other creatures next to them, so they'll live to the next stage. So let's take a step in time and, and see what it does. All right. So notice the middle of all of these things died, and then the middle of this died, and all these guys disappeared. All right. So now let's run it and see what happens. And there it goes. Now, this one wasn't too interesting. Uh, it, it's branching out a little bit down here, but not doing too much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw some more things in here. Okay. Now, the more complex or the more random nature you kind of start with, the oftentimes the longer it's going to run, or longer it'll be until it gets to one of these states where it's stuck, where nothing actually moves on. So you notice this guy is just oscillating, but this guy over here is still randomly kind of going. And he'll branch off, and he'll eventually come over here, and I can draw some more if you want. And the, the more you have, oftentimes, the longer it lasts. Some of them will go forever. Uh, some of them will get stuck in kind of a, a steady state where it just oscillates back and forth. All right, so come to this website, play around with it a bit. Uh, check out these patterns down here as well. Uh, these patterns, um, like, let's see. Oscillator, let's do the lightweight spaceship. Now it's going to load a new page here. And I need to zoom out. Okay, so what does it mean to be a spaceship? Well, the spaceship is something that will move across the screen based on the pattern. So notice it's going across like this. Uh, there's other patterns in here you can play with. There's guns. The guns will shoot stuff out. So for example, oh, there we go. Let me zoom out and run it. So notice, this is this is a kind of a complex little thing going here, but it's shooting thing these guys out, and they'll just keep making them, and these things will go flying across the screen. Okay, so kind of cool. Uh, so go take a look and look at all the complexity that this has. We're not going to deal too much with that. We're just going to work on building a really cool visualization. So let's go ahead and get started with the actual coding, and we'll leave all leave all of this stuff behind for now. All right, so. If you should have Python 3.4 installed, if you don't, if you're using an older version, you should be okay. Uh, I'm not sure about Python 2.7, if it's going to work with PyGLT, uh, PyGlit 2 well or not, or uh, give it a try. Uh, but just use Python 3.4 if otherwise. Okay, so first thing you want to do is install it. So all you just do is just do pip install PyGLT, and you should be fine. If I run this, it's already installed, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so how is a, a, a game or a window set up with, with Pyglet? Well, the first thing we got to do, of course, is we're going to import our library. And the second thing we're going to do is actually create a class. Now, there's a bunch of different ways you can create a window, but according to the website, according to the docs, the preferred way is to create a class. So I'm going to create class window, and I'm going to create it by inheriting from the class. Okay, so this window class, this is something you can find in the Pyglet documentation, and I'm just going to inherit from that class. And I'm going to go ahead and define my constructor here. Okay. And the very first thing I'm going to do in this constructor is I am going to call the inherited classes structure. Now, I'm going to show you this way, and then I'm going to show you the alternative way next time. 
Okay, so this is actually the old style of using super and in just a minute uh, after I get this program running, I'll come back and I'll actually delete everything in here and it will run just fine. Okay, uh, so in it is if you're used to Java or anything like that, I'm actually calling a constructor here and that's because in Python constructors are just really the same thing as any other method. So uh, you can call them just the same way. All right, so the first first thing I'm going to do here is come down here. I'm going to create an instance of this class. So I'm going to go ahead and make my if name is equal to main, which you've probably, if you've done Python, you've done this a million times before. I'm going to say window equals window. And then the last thing I need here is pygilt.app.run. So what it does is this creates an instance of our window class and nothing has really been done here but this and then i am going to run it here now i need to do one thing here uh, in addition i need to do self since i've inherited from this class i now have all of these fantastic uh, methods that come with the windows class uh, so i'll do set size to 600 let's do 600 by 600 for right now Okay, and if I run this, I will get a nice window that is 600 by 600. Okay, and notice it just stays up, it's running just fine. Okay, now I can actually go ahead and I can delete this and it will continue to run as normal. So as I said, putting this in here, uh, this is the old style way of calling the, uh, the parent classes constructor. You can just delete that as well. Okay, uh, so what else do I gotta do in order to put stuff on the screen? So this lesson, we're not really gonna get down to creating <laughs> cellular automata. We're just gonna get a window set up and we're gonna draw a single triangle to it. So the window class has a, a, uh, a method called onDraw. And what we're gonna do is override that method. And I'm gonna do self clear, which deletes the window so each time the draw method is called it will clear the window and then I'm going to create a triangle so I'm just gonna create a basic triangle now if you've done anything in other languages you're probably thinking alright well I can just do self dot draw triangle and put some coordinates in but since Pyglet is using OpenGL it's actually a little more complicated than that uh, what we can do later on is we'll create kind of a wrapper around that stuff in order to make it easier for us to draw triangles. But right now I'm going to show you what it looks like here. Okay, so pygilt.graphics.draw. And I'm going to use it doing something called indexed because this is going to help us save space later on. Now, this has a, a number of attributes. The first attribute, first parameter, actually is uh, going to tell us how many points we're going to have. So I'm going to say three points. And then we're going to be using pygilt.gl.gl triangles. And that tells us we're going to be creating a triangle. And the next thing is actually something that's kind of odd is what it is, is it's an index list. And that's why we have it indexed here is because we're going to make an index list and the index list tells us the points that we're accessing and it's going to match the points that I'm about to draw or I'm about to write down here. So V2I says we are working uh, with two uh, two dimensional vertexes. And then I'm going to draw, I'm going to write all of these vertexes. So I'm going to do 300 and 350. And I'm going to do 250, 250. And I'm going to do three, oops, 350 and 250. Okay. All right. There we go. Oh, I've got a small air in here. Oh, I know why. I need to put another brace right there. Okay, I know why. I need to put another brace right there. 
Okay. So Oh shit. Okay, and next thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna put V2I. This is telling us that we're working with two-dimensional vertexes. And now I'm gonna give it a vertex list. So my first vertex is 300 and 350. And I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna put these on separate lines here, 250 and 250, and 350 and 250. Okay, and I need to put one more there. Okay, so if I do that, I get this uh, nice window with a triangle in the middle. Now there's a couple weird things about this. Uh, first, you'll notice I'm just giving it a list of numbers. I don't section them off in any way that could be discerned as an individual vertex. And the reason it knows how many to take is because I have this V2I here. And the V2I says, take these two, make it a vertex in two, the two dimensional uh, plane, then another two and another two. This index here, this zero, this first zero, actually corresponds to the first two numbers here, which is my first point. The next number one corresponds to 250, 250, and two corresponds to 350, 250. All right, so three points. I have three different indexes. I'm naming essentially these points. I'm naming it zero, one, and two. So in the array, this this point this point and this point all have an index and this becomes handy later on because i can actually reuse indexes meaning if i want to take this and i want to put one more point here and then connect these i can actually just draw that write that point in change this to four and then i i would write instead comma one two three and we'll do that in the next lesson to draw a square for our our grid okay uh, the other weird thing you might notice is that these points actually co correspond not to points from the top left of the screen like many graphics libraries and many different 2D, uh, 2D graphics libraries use, but it actually is the bottom left corner. So you notice 250, 250, okay, and 250 is going to be here, and then this is 250 here. And then 350 is over here and 250. And then 300 and 350 is uh, right here in the middle and that's up there. So notice if I put, for example, say I take my bottom left corner and I put it at zero, zero. Let's save that. And let's put this one actually at zero here. And let's run it, okay? I get this distorted triangle from here, the bottom left corner, zero, zero, so coming up to here. So that might be a little bit weird for some people that are, are used to the zero, zero, the origin being up here at the top left, but you'll get used to it pretty quick because actually it really makes more sense because that's in math and everything where the, the origin resides. Okay. All right, uh, so that is about it for this first tutorial. Uh, we, all we did was create this triangle. Uh, it's a very, very simple little program. Uh, what we're going to do in the next lesson is we're going to we're going to create a little bit more. We're going to create the class for our grid. We're going to learn how to draw a square using multiple triangles, and then we'll load that up a bit with a whole bunch of random squares. Okay. All right. So this is just a very quick start, and we'll come back in the next lesson with some more complicated stuff. All right, uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next lesson.